все товарищи хороши. Если они действительно товарищи. Но самые главные товарищи – это те, кто первыми бросаются на помощь. Тут же, не раздумывая, не взвешивая все за и против. Кто же первым оказал помощь Советскому Союзу в борьбе с фашизмом? Подсказываем верный ответ. Первыми, кто откликнулся и предложил нам помощь, были Монголия и Тувинская Народная Республика. Давайте запомним это навсегда и выбьем на скрижалях. Монголы и тувинцы. Но если вглядываться зорче, то видим мы еще во всей этой истории и Великую Индию. Извечную мечту русских поэтов и путешественников, манившую нас многие столетия. И ужас Второй мировой, он вдруг сроднил нас. Mongolia, the country of Genghis Khan, nomads, the Gobi Desert with its red, black, and yellow sands. The great Mongol Empire is now long gone. For centuries, Qing Dynasty Manchu invaders ruled here. Only after 1900 did Mongolia regain independence, helped by Russia. In 1911, our embassy forced the Manchu regime to stop suppressing protests. Then we fought twice for Mongolian sovereignty. In 1921 and 1939, the Red Army, under future Marshal Zhukov, defeated the Japanese at Halkingol. Граница между Монгольской Народной Республикой и Союзом Советских Социалистических Республик стала границей двух дружественных демократических государств, поставивших своей целью мир и благосостояние широких народных масс. Our men fought alongside Mongol nomads, led by revolutionary Choi Balson, known as Chon, Wolf. For the Mongols, the wolf personified agility, endurance, energy, and intelligence. This son of the steppe was not only a revolutionary, but an educated man, a graduate of the teacher training college in Irkutsk. Besides his native tongue, he knew Tibetan, Russian, and some German. Посланцы монгольского народа во главе с премьер-министром и маршалом Монгольской Народной Республики Чай Балсаном, столица Советского Союза. After the USSR was treacherously invaded on June 22, 1941, the Mongolian People's Republic declared its support of the USSR. It was no surprise. Good neighbors help in times of trouble. The entire Mongolian government and Communist Party convened in Ulaanbaatar. There, they resolved to give the USSR maximum aid in its struggle. Mongolia was the first country to support the USSR. Помогайте Советскому Союзу, нашим братьям, бойцам Красной Армии, быстроногими конями, теплой одеждой, всем чем возможно. An urgently adopted conscription law drafted not only men, but women. The heirs of Genghis Khan, brave riders, were ready to fight the Germans. However, Moscow needed to use the Mongolian army to contain Japan. That was a huge help at the time. Few know today that thanks to the Mongols, we were able to transfer several divisions from the Far East to defend Moscow. Eight Mongolian cavalry divisions, a tank regiment, an armored brigade, 
little more than 80,000 men remained to guard the USSR's eastern borders. That was the calculation that was made. Much has been written about Western allies helping the USSR in World War II. Yet Mongolia has been forgotten, or many just don't know that Mongolia, with its small economy and just 800,000 people, made a huge effort to help us. Recall the famous sheepskin coats officers wore in newsreels as they defended Moscow in December 1941. Those were aid from Mongolia. The first freight train brought the Red Army 15,000 such coats, plus felt boots, quilted jackets, mittens, and scarves from camel, goat, and yak wool. A second run went directly to the 49th Army on the Western Front, to Marshal Zhukov himself. The Mongols had not forgotten their erstwhile commander. This run was a whole 236 train cars laden with 200 tons of meat, plus thousands of yards of famed Mongolian felt for yurts. You might ask why, but it was sent to partisan outfits beyond the front line. The train also brought by the thousands boots, belts, traditional woolen vests, gloves, and other warm things. Often, Mongolian leaders and major figures went personally to frontline units to present to the Red Army these gifts from a friendly people. Even when train cars were lacking or the railways were congested, the steppe nomads managed. In autumn 1942, a caravan of 1,200 camels left Mongolian Hoft. They carried the usual cargo of dried meat, socks, and felt boots, but also money contributed by Mongolian citizens to build T-34 tanks. Just think, men traveled thousands of miles of steppe and desert entrusted with this money. We thanked them and sent them back with sacks of flour and drums of vegetable oil, everything that we could afford then. World War II is called the first motorized war and the last stand of cavalry forces. Horses indeed bore this war too, and on both sides of the front. War horses were vital in the main army and in partisan outfits. They could silently slip past the enemy and transport guns in places without roads, bring wounded to field hospitals, or take provisions right to the battlefield. Before the war, the USSR had 17.5 million horses. The first months of the war saw 9 million animals lost in occupied areas but it's harder to urgently breed livestock in wartime than to build vehicles. It takes time for colts to grow up and to be ready for fighting. You just can't speed that up. The USSR could not buy so many needed horses from the USA or UK at any price. It was impossible to transport them from overseas. It was Mongolia who made up for this horse deficit. Трудные годы борьбы Советского Союза с германским фашизмом мысли чувства монгольского народа обращены к Красной Армии. 
Коневоды выделяют лучших скакунов для отправки в Советский Союз. Just imagine, a country of 800,000 people delivered 500,000 war horses to the USSR. The wild, free-roaming, hardy Mongols proved a real lifesaver. Of course, Mongolia could not supply us with weapons and combat vehicles. Still, they did not stand idle here either. To build up a new tank column, the Mongolian people raised an incredible 2.5 million Tugriks, $100,000, and 300 kilograms of gold. Again, they were a population of just 800,000. Comrade Choi Belsan came personally to present the tanks to the 112th Red Banner Tank Division, which had seen many losses near Tula. For the rest of the war, Mongolia itself ensured these fighters food and clothing. The people of this time were poor, let's recall. They sometimes had to do without, but never complained. On the contrary, the Mongols labored ceaselessly. They followed the old Mongolian commandment, instead of shedding tears, clench your fist tighter. And we might add, stretch out this hand to a friend to lean on. Tuva is a small nation south of the Sayan Mountains. This land of snowy peaks, clear lakes, and vast steppes gained independence in the 1920s. In 1914, they put themselves under the Tsarist regime. It was the last region to join the Russian Empire. In 1926, the Tuvan People's Republic signed a treaty of friendship with the USSR. I asked the old man what his cart was carrying, where from and where bound. He emptied out his pipe. He looked serious. Then he gestured with his pipe at the horizon. I'm taking along great love for country, hatred for the enemy, and the rage of my people. Thus wrote the Tuvan national poet, Sergei Pyorbyu. <laughs> Великий Курал, Тувинской Народной Республики, весь Тувинский народ, выражая горячие симпатии Союзу Советских Социалистических Республик в его исторической Великой Всенародной Войне с Гитлеровской Германией, заявил о своей готовности с оружием в руках бороться вместе с советским народом за полной победы над общим врагом германским фашизмом. Tuva was a tiny country with one cavalry regiment and no industry. Yet it fearlessly entered the war and hugely contributed to victory. At the time, it had less than 80,000 people. 12,000 held both local and Soviet citizenship, and so were subject to the USSR draft. If we subtract them and women, elderly and children, 20% of Tuva's men were ready to go to the front. No other country lent such help to the USSR. Tuva's material support beat all expectations, even what seemed possible. The Red Army received 
52,000 pairs of skis, myriad mittens and felt boots, and hundreds of tons of foodstuffs, meat, honey, taiga berries, medicinal herbs. All of Kizil's birch forest went to make skis. They gave their all, the metaphorical shirts off their backs. Note that even Tuva's gold reserves were handed over to the USSR, plus Tuva's gold mining industry of 5 million Soviet rubles. How can one adequately praise those who gave up their country's age-old legacy? The Tuvans lent aid not only in train cars, but ordinary suitcases, not just strategic assistance, but tokens of personal affection, which might warm the hearts of Red Army men in their brief moments of rest. Посланцы дружественной страны передают Красной Армии эскадрилью боевых самолетов, построенных на средства, собранные тувинским народом. Боевые машины уходят на фронт. Tuva went about declaring war in a unique way. Tuva only had embassies in Ulaanbaatar and Moscow. It sent a telegram to Moscow and asked us to forward it to Germany's diplomats. Rumor has it that Hitler scoffed at Tuva's declaration of war. The country was missing from his maps. But he was wrong to laugh. In early 1943, it was decided to train personnel from Tuva. The Republic's first volunteers joined the Red Army in May 1943. After basic training, they entered the 25th Tank Regiment. How did these sons of the steppe and mountains, living a tech-free life, manage to master the tank? Consider the story of Lieutenant Homushki Shurguiul Namgayevich. On March 13, 1944, at the crossing of the southern Bug River, he drove his vehicle underwater, and on the other side, he immediately began fighting. He crossed a river bottom, spent 13 days inside his tank, and naturally received the title Hero of the USSR. Tuvans arrived at the front during the liberation of Ukraine. They fought for it as if Ukraine were their own kin. Some 20 Tuvan soldiers were decorated with the Order of Glory. As the 8th Guards Cavalry Division's command wrote to the Tuvan government, in fighting near Surmichi village, 10 gunners led by Dongur Kizil and anti-tank rifles led by Daji Seren died, but they fought to their last bullet. Around these men who died heroically were over 100 slain enemy. The enemy could not pass where Tuva's sons stood. A total of 8,000 men left Tuva for the front, of whom 1,912 died, that is, 25%. On August 17, 1914, Tuva's government resolved that Tuva would join the USSR. This was approved by the Supreme Soviet on October 11th. Tuva became an autonomous region of the Soviet Union. The Asian Pacific region 
was an arena for the great powers even before World War II. The British Empire tried to hold on to its vast colonial holdings. The United States imposed the Atlantic Charter, which restored rights and self-rule to nations violently deprived of them. This was not out of pure love for UK colonized peoples, but a play for a zone of American influence and a market for goods. The scale of King George VI's possessions are stunning. They included what is now India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, half-independent Nepal, and many Pacific islands. These territories were home to 400 million people, nearly one-fifth of the world's population then. Many of these people chafed at British rule. The Japanese took advantage of that. Their invasion began in January 1942. In Burma, war broke out with Japan, a Nazi satellite. This really helped us, as our eastern foe was kept tied up in these grim years. Japanese bombers attacked Rangoon and other Burmese cities. The bombing had a heavy civilian toll. Many abandoned their homes and rushed to British India. The brutality of the Japanese drove many locals to join the resistance. By May of 1942, the Japanese had a firm grip over the entire country. Popular uprisings led Japan to declare Burma independent in August 1943, but this was a mere illusion. The Japanese plundered the Burmese peasants even more than the British. Burma was ripe for rebellion, which started in March 1945. But the creation of a Burmese army led to real independence, which came on January 4th, 1948. is in arms, training troops as fast as they can be trained. In British India, 2.5 million volunteered for the fight against Hitler on every continent that the war involved. However, this army proved a cause of the collapse of British rule in India. It was impossible to hold on to a country with so many former soldiers and weapons. India became independent on August 15, 1947. This is an important subject today, though sometimes forgotten. World War II, the Great Patriotic War. It wasn't just a war. It posed an end to all our lives. It augured darkness. But the war also gave the world's peoples a fierce drive for independence and self-determination. After becoming brothers to us and comrades in arms, many peoples threw off colonialism. This was another huge and wonderful outcome of our common victory. May 1945 was not only a red flag over the Reichstag, it was a flag flying over all humanity too. Glory to the great victory. May we always remember those who overcame darkness. The victory in 1945 
is the freedom of the world. The victory of 1945 is life. The victory is God's work, and he had no other hands than us. We proved worthy. Thank you.